like Christopher Hitchens, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to walk around, use the microphone like this, and try not to fall off this latch here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, okay. So, uh, first two things I want to take away from what has been said previously. Um, the first thing I want to say is, uh, or want to note is that Amadeo was talking about Hans Rösling. And uh, has any of you ever seen Hans Rösling's uh, talks about population growth? If you have, you know, with the boxes and with the spear and whatnot, he tells us that, you know, the world population might top out at around 11 billion people. I always take 10. I'm a little bit skeptic about 11. <laughs> but. Uh, 10 billion people, that's going to be our major concern or a major problem, actually. Uh, the second thing I want to say, and listen very carefully to my language, I just drove in here. I have a 12-year-old sat-nav, so it, it was sending me in circles in Ghent. And so I parked way out of the city, and I had to walk. So in all likelihood... I'm the most sweaty people, most sweaty person in here. <laughs> okay, there you have it. The Enterprise Star Trek seems to be a common theme today. <laughs> so I was born in the '80s. My parents were both Star Trek fans, obviously, and uh, they let me watch uh, Star Trek as well. Um, I have one problem, and that is that I have been gifted with a uh, recurring depression. So this means that I am always looking for things to, you know, ease my mind. So instead of always being, always analyzing stuff, because I'm always analyzing stuff, I also like to read books and I like to play games. So one of the games that I was playing about 10 years ago was Call of Duty. And Call of Duty is like this, first person shooter, you run around with, uh, with a gun in your hand and you have a ghillie suit on and you have to try and kill people. Not very nice, but it's all fictional, so it's all right. And this particular shot that you see here is actually situated in the Pripyat area. And Pripyat, for those who don't know, is where Chernobyl's at. And during this game, you have to crouch around in the bushes and make sure that you're not seen. And you have to avoid the radiation area. So there's all these little sticks in the ground and there's these, uh, these triangles with uh, nuclear symbols on them. And if you go too far into the nuclear area, you die. And once I, once I, once I witnessed that, I was like, this is baloney. That can't be true. So what I do as a skeptic, instead of accepting that that is the truth, I go on Google and I start Googling stuff like Chernobyl and whatnot. And it turns out that there's actually people living in the exclusion zone. It's becoming less and less every year, but that's because the economy has died in the exclusion zone. It, it, was, it was somewhere around 2000 back in the 1990s. And right now it's down to 200. But it, it has nothing to do with radiation whatsoever. It's all to do with, you know, the economy is just no longer there. So there's nothing to do. Only the grandmothers stay behind. That's basically it. Now, what's even more baffling, to, or what was more baffling to me, after I learned from the uh, United Nations report about Chernobyl, which Ida just shared with us, the figures, uh, is that you can actually book tours into the exclusion zone. You can go there. I, I've been planning to do one for years. Friends of mine have already been there. But what you see here is the sarcophagus, and that sarcophagus is not airtight. It's like, you know, if that was a boat, you won't go on the water. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. But you can see there's people in, uh, I, I don't know if it's, this is a mink uh, coat or something, but they are taking pictures and they're all fine with it. So, so um, you know, the skeptic mind in me, once he sees this kind of empirical evidence, and I, I mean, this is empirical evidence, I'm fine with it. 
So basically, what I learned back in 2008 when I was playing Call of Duty and I was dying because I wanted to have the best crouch spot in the area is that according to the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the World Nuclear Association and the International Agency of uh, Atomic Energy Agency, um, basically they say it's baloney. You don't have to be that afraid of nuclear. And it turns out that we don't have to be as afraid of nuclear because some people have come out and said the evacuations at Chernobyl and the evacuations at Fukushima were unnecessary and the most deaths came from those events rather than the meltdowns themselves. So let's fast forward to 2010. Nuclear was still in the back of my mind but I was not really paying it any heed. I was planning to buy a new house at that time. I have a wife, we have two children, back then I had one child, and I wanted to be self-sufficient, you know, the dream of every environmentally conscious person. So I started calculating how many solar panels I needed to put on my roof, how many batteries I needed, uh, you know, heat pumps, all this, all this stuff, and it turns out that it would cost about somewhere between 50,000 and 75,000 euros, which is a lot of money, which I don't have. So prompted by this failure to model a home that I could afford, I started looking for, you know, alternatives. And one of the first alternatives was the the, 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 the solutions project by Mark C. Jacobson. He says we can power the world with only wind and solar, basically, and at reasonable cost, and all will be well. We will defeat climate change, there will be no problems, you name it. Well, I, at that time, I was already looking into climate change. I was a skeptic, I, I, I didn't believe a lot of it, but it turns out I actually emailed these people, so. The left one is James Hansen, the middle one is Kerry uh, Emanuel, and the right one is Ken Caldera, who has become a friend of mine. And uh, turns out they say, well, you have to take this seriously. This is the evidence that we provide in order to, you know, substantiate that climate change is a serious problem. And uh, you have to take into account that the renewables only group of people, they are basically trying to sell us something which is unfeasible. So, you know, um, first of all, I'm, 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 I'm doing this ad lib, by the way, so at some point I might go off track. But in any case, the data tells us all we need to know about climate change. I have, I have perused databases, I have perused the origi original GIS, GI, GISS database, I'm getting all these uh, monthly reviews from James Hansen. And it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite simple. I, I think that climate change is a serious enough issue to you know, act upon. Now, the real problem, and it's not necessarily climate change because we have to solve that in any case, but what's an even bigger problem is that the world population is going to increase. Hans Riesling told us as much. If you consult the internet, uh, you will see you know, most most people agree we are going to top out somewhere between nine and a half and 11 billion people. So the poor have a right not to be poor. Has anybody here ever considered that? I mean, how many people are poor in the world? There are a lot of poor people in the world. And the worst part of it is that the fertility rate amongst those people is highest. And they already have problems getting access to potable water and food. And with the advent of climate change, so with uh, more precipitation, less precipitation, more heat, less heat, uh, you know, agriculture becomes less dependable, especially in the tropics. So um, the problem we have to solve is how do we make sure that we get more resilient? How do we make sure that these people have the availability of water, have the availability of energy to produce whatever they need? Now, if you look at uh, this graph, which is a graph from the uh, Energy Information Administration of the US, you can see that the non-OECD, which is basically all the developing countries uh, with China, India, um, 
they already consume more energy than we do. But if you look at it from a different perspective, so what you see here is that we have the OECD and the non-OECD plotted. So let's see in the top, in the top chart you see the, the OECD uses up, uses up about 72,000 terawatt hours per year and the non-OECD uses up about 103,000 terawatt hours per year. Now suppose that everything stays the same and the non-OECD manages to produce commensurate amounts of ex extra energy while their population keeps growing. So maintaining the status quo, this is where we will end up. So that's about 210,000 terawatt hours. And that's significantly more than we have today. It's about 40,000 terawatt hours of energy that we have to get somewhere in order to make sure that these people have water, food, soap for hygiene, you know, the, basics, the basic stuff. So um, this is the problem, maintaining status quo. Now, is it moral? to expect those people to maintain their living standard. I, I, personally, I am opposed to that idea. I think these people need more energy because they need to improve their way of life, uh, they need to improve their quality of life. So suppose that the per capita energy consumption per person, so the, the per person energy availability in the non-OECD doubles energy demand is going to explode. What we have today is not even enough to, you know, make sure that half of the world's population has a reasonable degree of life. So the problem is, what does an increase in energy demand mean? So it's not just the electricity for our phone, right? Our phone, our fridge, our washing machine, whatever. You know, you need direct access to potable water, you need a better variety of food, which means that you have to get food from all places around the world, which has to be carted around. You know, improve quality of the built environment instead of living in a hut. You are now living in a house that has insulation, that has uh, some, 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 some sort of heat, heating system or cooling system. Um, it also means, you know, the simple things, improved safety. You need a fire department, you need a, a police department, you need more education, you name it. All those things cost energy before they cost money. If you don't have the energy to do it, forget about it. So we want to lift, we want to lift the general uh, energy prosperity of the world. So what we see here is the correlation between the human development and the annual per capita electricity use, electricity use, note, it's not energy use, it's just electricity. So you talk about electricity for your wish, dishwasher, your washing machine, your refrigerator, you name it. These people over here, and you see there's India right there, uh, I mean, Kenya is somewhere around here, big countries, even China is still down here somewhere, there's China. So they still lag behind on the Human Development Index. And the Human Development Index is nothing but the sum of all the services and all the goods that people can get on average in a country. Now, these countries, they have, they have basically reached energy prosperity, the green countries over there. But it takes about 4,000 kilowatt hours per person per year in order to lift yourself up from there to there. So it's 4,000 kilowatts per person per year. Now the problem is most of the people actually believe that renewables can perform that trick. And at this moment, I, I, I call it a magic trick. It's like they are trying to do something with with accounting and if, if, if these people are honest, like the Mark C. Jacobsons of this world who say we can do it all using renewables, they are being dishonest but they, because they don't account for 300,000 terawatt hours, they only account for 100,000 terawatt hours per year. So increasing energy prosperity for all mankind is impossible.
if we go down those paths. But if you listen to, for instance, Bernie Sanders, he's already saying, and, and I mean, he's becoming a serious candidate, right? He is like the runner up at this moment. If, if we have to believe Bernie Sanders, he is going to do the Mark C. Jacobson trick. And how they are going to do it is a riddle to me because I've tried to, you know, corroborate those claims and I've done it more than just, you know, the bare energy stuff. I, I, the point is, the total renewable delta in 2017, so the additions was 170, 180 gigawatts. Now, if you turn this into energy, that's about 475 terawatt hours per year. Now, if we need 300,000 terawatt hours per year, the gap is already 130,000 terawatts per year. Now, if you look at, we want to, you know, cross this gap somehow, we have 210,000 terawatt hours, and we need to reach that in 30 years, that means that we have to add 7,000 terawatt hours per year. Now, at our current rate, that's not enough. We need to, we need to improve our rate of renewable deployments by 14 times to meet status quo in 30 years, status quo. None of the people in Africa, none of the people who are poor in Asia are going to get a washing machine or a bicycle or a telephone or whatever. Now, if we want to give them those bicycles and telephones and washing machines and access to potable water and food and whatnot, we have to go up to 336,000 terawatt hours. That's 24 times the amount of renewable additions that we are doing today. Now, it takes a big leap of faith for a skeptic like me to accept that as feasible. I don't think it's feasible at all. I think it's a magic trick. Now, the conclusion is renewables can't do it all. So what else do we need? I've already told you that I'm not afraid of nuclear power. So there it is. We need nuclear power. And the funny thing is, many people always say, well, nuclear power takes too long. You know, it takes 10, 15 years to build. That's not true. This data comes from the World Nuclear Association, and they tell us that the average build time per decade is, it has only been once when it took 10 years, that was the five years between 1996 and 2000. So in 2017, it took about 58 months to build a nuclear reactor or a nuclear power plant, that depends. Let's see, it says medium construction times for reactors, reactors. But that's a, that's a finished reactor, that's a reactor that is putting juice onto the grid. So many people say, well, you know, nuclear is old technology, renewables are the new thing. That's just false. If you look at wind energy, that's thousands of years old. We had windmills back in Persia when, when, when we were still driving around in horse buggies. Uh, we had PV not last century, but the century before, you know, the 19th century. And uh, nuclear power has actually been relatively flat over the past 50 years. But that doesn't mean that there has been no innovation. If we look at Current innovation, we see totally different reactor concepts. Nuclear reactors that can actually be built in a factory instead of, you know, built on site. And, um, I mean, the options are amazing. I mean, there's like a million different ways we can do nuclear. And, you know, the Chernobyl way is not accepted, by the way. If you look at uh, the specifics of that design and you compare it to other designs that are equally old, you can see that it is considered an Ill illegal design. And luckily, only a handful of those have ever been built. None of them have ever been built since. So um, nuclear innovation is ongoing. We can do tremendous amounts of, you know, we can do loads of, <laughs> I'm doing a Trump right now. It's, <laughs> That's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> no, but the, the thing is that the things that are perceived as problems like cost, like waste, those are all addressed in new nuclear reactors. But I want to also tell you that 
Current nuclear reactors are fine. If there's anyone here in this room who wants to support nuclear, contemporary nuclear reactors are fine. If somebody wants to build one, cheer them on because it's hard enough. And let me be honest, I'm not the one who thinks that nuclear is the silver bullet. Even if we would use nuclear with all the renewables that have been put forth by the Jacobsons and the, the LUTs in Finland, even if we add nuclear, it's going to be a hell of a job, and I doubt that we will make it. But not using nuclear is tantamount to saying, well, I give up. I don't care anymore. So uh, thank you all for not running away. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll go for a break, um, and we come back at uh, 3.30 for the next two talks. And we'll have the panel session with all the speakers at the end. <laughs>